Max the? Max. Love the? Max. Gardel? Yeah. The next speaker generated quite a bit, hasn't he? We know. Broncos. Cancelled. A club known for its integrity and courage pulled the pin after they were got at. 50 academics trying to protect who knows what. Scared. And the media, have you had a look at those academics? The ABC keep parading advocates on the TV and the radio who have been guilty of misrepresenting the science. Just in the last week, I've had an ABC journalist call me wanting contact with some scientists, so I provided her with some names. All three of the scientists she has contacted have been disgusted. She was not interested in the science from what they could see, she was interested in muckraking. That was their opinion. That's your taxpayers' money. Control. Why do people control? Underneath control there is? Money. Fear. Why would you be afraid of a man who's done so much research? I'll tell you why you'd be afraid. He's got a long list of qualifications, a long list of proven successes. You can Google them and have a look. Listen to this though. He's respectful of others. I've watched him clean up someone absolutely in a debate in Brisbane. Entirely respectful, gracious in victory. He's knowledgeable on the science. He's knowledgeable on the maths. He's got experience in the bureaucracy, which is where the corruption started. He could see this scam, and he exposed it. He exposed the Copenhagen Draft Treaty, which shows provisions in there to rob us of our national sovereignty, our finances, control our energy, and listen to this, I've read it, control the allocation of resources and property. He is knowledgeable, insightful, incisive, masterful, and he's also entertaining. That got him into strife, but he apologised unreservedly for what one careless comment. I want to introduce to you a man very strong in character, very strong and knowledgeable. I welcome to Sydney Viscount Monckton of Brenchley. something like this. To be or the contrary. <laughs> Whether the former or the latter be preferable would seem to admit of some difference of opinion. The answer in the present case being of a negative or of a positive char character, according to whether one elects on the one hand mentally to endure the disfavour of fortune, albeit in an extreme degree, or on the other boldly to envisage adverse conditions and the prospect of eventually bringing them to a conclusion that conditional sleep is similar to, if not indistinguishable from, that of death, and with the addition of finality, the former might be considered identical with the latter, so that in this connection it could be argued, with regard to sleep, that were the addition to be effected, a termination might be put, put to the endurance of a multiplicity of inconveniences, not to mention a number of downright evils incidental to our form of humanity, and thus a consummation achieved of a most gratifying nature. <laughs> Speak to in plain English 
with the sort of language that a football club would certainly not find too difficult to understand. There has been, as you see the slide there, 300 years of global warming. <laughs> as this piece of reliable empirical evidence <laughs> And uh, I prepared this slide for Bill Clinton. <laughs> now, uh, deforestation is a problem for dogs, as you can see and if you want to know where the global warming is coming from, it's actually Al Gore with his flamethrower on the top of the Greenland ice sheet. And there is a correlation, a rather interesting one, I think you'll find, between the number of sunspots on the surface of the sun and the number of Republican senators in Washington. And you'll be glad to hear that the number of sunspots on the sun is growing, and so is the number of Republican senators in Washington. It works. And of course, Al Gore says that sea level is going to rise by 20 feet almost immediately. If it did, this is what would happen to the Houses of Parliament. To which my reply is, and your problem is, <laughs> global warming has a number of rather interesting benefits. Now, a horse goes into a bar and the barman says, why the long face? Because it's a horse, you idiot. <laughs> the points I'm going to be making to you today about the science and the economics and morality and politics of global warming are all going to be points as obvious as that. Because the extraordinary thing, the extraordinary achievement of the bedwetting classes, which include your current government and your climate commission, is to have made the obvious seem absurd and the absurd seem obvious. And we're going to straighten that out again in a very straightforward, factual way. Now, why is the truth so important and why is consensus so unimportant? Well, the first thing to say about consensus is that, as you heard from Joe Nova 2,400 years ago, Aristotle codified the dozen communist fallacies of logic in human speech. And not the least of these is the consensus or headcount fallacy. Just because you're told a lot of people say they believe something doesn't mean that they say they believe it, still less that they do believe it, still less that even if they do believe it, it is true. Just because there's a consensus about something, it tells you absolutely nothing in reason or logic about whether it is true. And every time you hear anyone from your government or your climate commission or your ABC, <laughs> every time I say, every time I say ABC, I want to hear the right reaction. I can't. Every time you hear them say that there is a consensus and therefore we must salute and obey and believe, then you know that you're not listening to science but political prejudice. So let's look at some of the consensus that have happened in the 20th century. First of all, all a picture here of the Versailles Conference to decide what to do about Germany in 1980. And everyone was agreed that Germany should be made to pay through the nose for having lost the war. Result, the Second World War grew out of the, uh, the, the First World War because the reparations imposed on Germany were so savage that Hitler was given an excuse and almost an incentive to go to war again. So consensus kills. That's the first thing we learn about it. And then, of course, there was the eugenics consensus. Almost throughout the civilized world, if you can call it civilized, in the 1920s, it was the belief among scientists and among politicians and among the chattering classes, the usual suspects, exactly the kind of people that are now saying, you global world me. These people they were all agreed among themselves that breeding humans like racehorses would improve the stock. Well, this nasty idea, taken up with alacrity by Hitler and Heydrich, led directly to the dismal railway yards of Oshvienshim that you see here and Tripik. Six million died of consensus. And then, oh yes, peace in our time. I have here a piece of paper. That's what he said. He was right about the piece of paper. <laughs> but he wasn't right about peace in our time. The policy of the preemptive cringe, or appeasement as it was called, was universally held. 
of the 450 members of parliament, only 21 disagree. 